Welcome to Big Blend Radio with your hosts, Lisa and Nancy, editors of BigBlendMagazine.com. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Big Blend Radio's third Tuesday Go to Natchitoches show. Uh, now, Natchitoches is the oldest settlement in the state of Louisiana, and it's pronounced Natchitoches, but it is uh, spelled out as N-A-T-C-H-I-T-O-C-H-E-S. Uh, it is one of our favorite destinations. Why we do this every third Tuesday because there's so much history and there's so much nature to enjoy. There's a mm, beautiful so historic downtown. There's good food like Natchitoches meat pies, um, and it is just really a destination that if you love history, you definitely want to go. Um, so the website for Natchitoches is natchitoches.com, and every third uh, Tuesday we get to chat with our friend Arlene Gould, who is the executive director of the Natchitoches. Nakedish Convention and Visitor Bureau. So welcome back, Arlene. How are you? Hi, ladies. I'm doing very well. Thank you. It is good to have cool. you back on the show, and we look forward uh, to visiting you sometime, probably in July, just because that's our annual thing. It's our annual trek. Every <laughs> one to two years, we go to, to Nakedish, and it, except for one time after all these years, it's always in July. It just happens mm-hmm. that way. And um, Well, that's okay. You're welcome. Anytime of the year. Oh, we love it there. Thank you. Christmas season, anytime. You come whenever you can. It would, July and oh yeah, we still got to do Christmas. Natchitoches is famous for Christmas Ooh, and yeah. Christmas lights. Is it three hundred thousand lights that go up on Cane River Lake and in the downtown? Is it three hundred thousand? It's Something probably like more than three hundred thousand lights, and we have over a hundred set pieces set along the river. They're all handmade, welded by you know part of our city utility department and the guys there do a wonderful job every year this year will be the 97th year wow <laughs> that's amazing christmas lunch. yeah that's, wow. that's, pretty cool. that's amazing that cool. you know mm-hmm. um i want to say that everyone should know that natchitoches is also part of the cane river uh national heritage area uh, because again, so much history. Um, we first discovered Natchitoches uh, as part of our Love Your Parks tour, traveling the country where we document parks of all shapes and sizes, whether it's a national park, a national monument, a state park, a county park, or you know, a national forest. A um, I don't care if it's a little tiny pocket park. We're going. That's right. And um, we went to go to uh, visit Cane River Creel National Historical Park. And um, that is home to two separate plantations. So a lot of history. A bicentennial farm is on, uh, one of them. And um, then we discovered all these other parks. And and also that Natchitoches is um, part of was actually a main destination. It's like the end destination of the El Camino Real de los Tejas National Historic Trail. And this leads us to our special guest of the day. Uh, Felicia Brand is joining us from the Fort St. Jean Baptiste Louisiana State Historic Park, which is an iconic uh, site in, in the downtown area um, or the heritage area of uh, Natchitoches. So welcome to the show, Felicia. How are you? I'm doing good. Hello, hello. It's good to be here. It's great to have you here. And did I say Fort St. John correctly? Bapti- Fort St. John Baptiste. Is it Baptiste? Um, not Baptist, yes, right? Yes, ma'am. Baptiste. <laughs> Baptiste. Saint John Baptiste. If you want to be extra fancy, Jean Baptiste. Ooh, Jean. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> yes. We like that. We like that. So tell us a little bit about, because we've been to the fort and one of the first things I'd say is to watch the video there, but you can, it's really like a replica of the fort, right? So it's um, it not the original. It's not the original. The original fort was built 1716, and it just, it did not survive the terrain. So mm. what happened was the early 20th century, like 1920s, 1930s, the blueprints were found in French archives. And whenever the state of Louisiana got the blueprints, they decided that they would build the fort replica uh, just as close to the original site as they could put it. So we are technically within 400 yards of the original oh. site for that fort. Wow. Where the replica sits today. Yes, ma'am. And That's and right the original there. one was, yeah, right where Cane oh. River Lake now is kind of like the oxbow of what was the Red River, right? So the, originally it was the Red River that it was set next to. 
Well, the Red River fed into Cane River. Okay. And then 1915, they dammed up where the Cane River met the Red River up at Grandy Core. And when they dammed it up, that's when Cane River became Cane River Lake. Okay. And that's why the okay. water is so low now. Hmm. And and people should go to uh, Grand Decor as well. There's a wonderful visitor center. It's a great way to start to get some of the history of the region yeah. and the Cane River National Heritage Area. But it, it really does connect. I think the fort, that's really like kind of the beginning settlement of of like of the territory, right? Um, so you've got a lot yeah. of different cultural history that connects to the fort. Exactly right. We have uh, whenever the territory was French. So when I say territory, I mean the Louisiana Purchase as we know it. When it was French, we were a French fort. When the Spanish had the territory, we were Spanish, and then back to French before becoming American in eighteen oh uh, what was eighteen oh three. Mm. Okay. Oh. And but the fort so itself the fort itself would never be American per se because the fort was gone by that point. They had to build Fort Claiborne when the Americans took over. Mm. Oh. Okay. So wow. we, we are getting way past the history of here, yes, but <laughs> but but that's the thing. I mean, it, it that's what I think is so iconic about the history of Natchitoches, and then it ties into what's known as no man's land. Is so many things happened, and it was like so many takeovers, right? So, can you tell us just like who, uh, you know, for, you've got Saint Denis, right? Am I? <laughs> I'm going to get in trouble with these pronunciations. You're, you're um, doing good on your pronunciation so far. Arlene taught me. I'm just putting Arlene on the spotlight for that. She she teaches. She teaches well. But tell us, like, how this whole thing started. Like, how did the fort actually become a fort and why? So, uh, explorer, tradesman, he, he held many titles. Uh, Louis Juchereau Saint Denis. And oh, he me. was traveling from the French territory into Spanish territory, hoping to open up a trade route between the two countries. Because at the time, the United States were split multiple countries. And okay. going into what is now Texas, he was going into Spanish territory, but he crossed through what is now Natchitoches. He met the Natchitoches tribe. That's where the city gets his name. So when okay. he met the Natchitoches tribe, he decided to leave a trade post there, continue on his travels, and when he returned in 1716, he built the actual fort that would start the population growth into the city. Okay. And so then the El Camino Real, that was kind of like a royal road that was being utilized kind of beforehand, right? So then everybody just... It, that went through different cultures as well, because but wasn't it like Native American in, at the beginning? Well, I know it was the Spanish Royal Road. So that went from Mexico City to what is Los Adias, mm. which is in Robeline, just outside Natchitoches. And that was the original route for the El Camino into our territory. And the Louisiana Purchase territory area was Spanish, then that El Camino ended at Port St. John. Okay. And wow. whenever it reverted back to French, that actual road uh, name could no longer be El Camino, so it was just called the Old Road to El Camino. And now Everything. it's really, you can travel the whole thing. I mean, you can do this. It's a National Historic Trail, so you can do it all through the state of Texas into Louisiana go to the fort. So the fort was like the final spot, or is it the starting or the ending, or does it matter? <laughs> like, you know? So that that is always the question. And we okay. jokingly tell visitors, it's, well, it depends on which side you're wanting to start on. If you're coming from Canada and you want to get into the El Camino, then we're the starting point. If you're coming up from South America and you want to hit the El Camino, then Mexico City would be the starting point. Mm. See, it's kind of like the historic Jefferson Highway, Arlene. Exactly. Uh -huh. You're from <laughs> Winnipeg right, to Pines New Orleans. To <laughs> yeah, it's either the Pines to Palms or Palms to Pines, mm -hmm. whichever way you want to float exactly. your boat. 
exactly. <laughs> or drive your car these days. But, you know, and right now, I, I do want to give a shout out because it's really neat that you can do the El Camino Real, um, the historic trail from Natchitoches, Louisiana to Nacogdoches, Texas. And mm-hmm. it's it's a beautiful, yeah. like, little day drive um, taking you through historic sites. This beautiful country. I mean, it's mm-hmm. it's a it's a and gorgeous, it's beautiful drive. all year round. Mm-hmm. It really is. Yes. You know, you don't have to worry about seasons. It's just beautiful yeah. all year round. Which I yeah, find no, really we consider our, our, right our Nacogdoches to our Nacogdoches to Nacogdoches part of the El Camino Real. We refer to that as the Caddo region, you know, because it's it's such a large trail that's kind of divided up. But we we're considered the Caddo region when you when you look at the part from Nacogdoches, Texas to Nacogdoches, Louisiana. And of course, there's the old folklore story about Nacogdoches and Nacogdoches, the two Indian stories Mm -hmm. (laughs) or the two Indian brothers. The story goes that Chief Caddo, uh, you know, I always like to tell this story because it's just kind of like fun. But Mm -hmm. um, he sent one one son to the west and one son to the east for a moon Mm -hmm. and a sun, meaning a day and a night. And Nacogdoches, Texas would be the son that went to the west. And incidentally, the uh, Nacogdoches is the oldest town in Texas, and Nacogdoches is the oldest in Louisiana purchased territory. So Nacogdoches would have been the son that came to the east. And of course, there's Stephen F. Austin University in Nacogdoches, mm-hmm. or in Texas, I should say, and then Nac- uh, Nacogdoches has Northwestern University. So when the two football college teams play, they vie for the tallest trophy in college football, which is the seven-foot-tall hand-carved Chief Caddo. Whoever wins gets to bring Chief back home. <laughs> cool. See? Wow. That's cool. That's a big seven feet tall. Wow. <laughs> that's, that's a that's, big that's history. That's like bringing Shaq O'Neal into your house. Oh, here we go. You know, they just unearthed a giant penguin the size of Shaq O'Neal. So. I know. Uh-huh. I do. <laughs> there, th- this is all in perspective, right? You know, that's and that's actually the cool thing. Again, like going to the fort, like when you think about things being in perspective, you get a semblance of what it was like to be in that period. Like even as a soldier, or if you were at the fort, like how they slept. I'm sorry, but like it does get warm in Natchitoches in the summer, but the way they all had to like bunk up. Yeah. I mean, Felicia, isn't that that, you know, that's one thing I think for kids have got to be like, you know, kids oh. are always, you know, if they have uh, brothers and sisters, they're like, I want my own room. And yeah. then when they see what what people had to go through to to sleep out there, that wasn't that easy for for people coming through. You think it's a resting spot, but it really wasn't. <laughs> well, the thing with the fort itself is that would be for your single soldiers. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, um, we have big communal beds that would usually sleep eight side by side, and it's it gets cozy. I won't lie. It gets a little cozy in there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, and then, speaking of the heat, inside the fort, it can be about 15 degrees warmer middle of summer than the heat index. Wow. So, how they yeah. survived, it, it amazes me. We get yeah. kids, we get adults who say, I'm glad I have AC. And it's like, yeah, mm-hmm. that is probably the best invention. <laughs> when you look yeah. at the perspective of the the fort then mm-hmm. and anywhere now. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, yeah, Because they didn't have like, I, you know, ice chests and, you know, refrigerators as much, you know, in the early days. And. I mean, you, what's cool about going down the road to Cane River Creole National Historical Park is you can see how the bicentennial farm progressed over the years. So suddenly you're in this very historic plantation house and then you go in the kitchen and you're back in the 50s and 60s. <laughs> so, so that's kind of a trip to see how the farm progressed over the years. But at the fort, like I, I remember like they had it, like a giant pizza oven outside, which I thought would be cool to have in my backyard. That's cool. <laughs> but, um, it's like they had to bake and do all these things, even no matter how hot it was. Um, and to keep things, I mean, I don't know how they must have like hunted and, and you know, 
eaten whatever they got like right away, right? To be able to survive food wise because of the well, heat. Well, they, they uh, knew how to do various ways of preserving meat. So let's, let's say someone goes out deer hunting, they bring their meat bag, it's already cleaned, what have you, they have their fresh meat. They can cook some at that point, just like we do a roast, a stew, what what have you. But then they would also smoke it. And if mm-hmm. they had the salt, they would salt it. And salt. so they, they knew how to jerky it. They knew how to make it last longer than a couple days. Mm-hmm. Um, but talking about just the bread oven, what you're talking about is our, our bread oven out there, that is not the worst place to cook. The worst place would be inside in those fireplaces where they have a constant flame going 365, 24-7. Wow. It doesn't matter how warm it is outside, they have to have a fire going. It's their form of electricity, essentially. It's their nighttime light. It's how they... Uh, make water safe to drink. They understood boiling water means we can drink it without getting sick. Uh, mm. Cooking, doing laundry because they would wash their clothes and boiling water, all that. Wow! And now we it's say, like, don't put don't put the heat on for the cl- you know your laundry. I put know. It I was just cold. thinking, was like <laughs> now your clothing says do not boil. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Depending <laughs> on, on what you need done, so. That's got to, it's going to be cool for kids to, you know, when we see how kids are, I mean, adults too, just attached to phones and and technology, be able to go to the fort and because it's also a natural area. I mean, it's, it, you can see the lake and, and everything. Um, you've got to, it's always, it's got to be amazing just to watch their faces about this is how people lived and, oh, and survived. It's, it's wonderful. I'm, I went to school for history, so this is my element. And everyone mm. always asks, why didn't you become a teacher? Honestly, every day I work here, I'm a teacher. It's just mm-hmm. a different class. And these yeah. kids come in, and they love it. We get school groups all throughout fall and spring, and I love telling this story. I had a student come in, and she understood there's no electricity, so they can't charge their phones. They can't <laughs> charge their iPads. But how did they charge the Wi-Fi? And I had to explain to her the Internet didn't exist yet. Mm. <laughs> and that was the most mind-blowing thing to her was that the Internet did Isn't not that exist crazy? yet. <laughs> That's, you know, that is really interesting, you know, because if you go right back down to like old Indian days where they use smoke signals to talk mm. to each other. And, you know, right? Yeah. And here we are now, and it's so, I can understand where kids, you know, that's a big leap in your mind. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I think the, the more. That's all, they've known. that's all they've ever known growing up. Mm-hmm. I mean, they, yeah. they're, you know, they're, they, they are pretty amazed when we tell them all the, all the stories of how people lived in the past and they're. You know, I don't want to say dumbfounded, but they're like, what? What are you talking about? How could yeah. that be? You know? Oh, very shocked. Like, oh. Yes. Yeah, mm-hmm. we've come a long way. Yeah. Well, I and think no, it's, this is why no it's so TV. important. Like, yeah, no well, television. No TV. Yeah, but it's like, Dude. I mean, even now TV's changed how it used to be. I mean, now we, mm-hmm. I mean, remote controls. We never had remote controls. Full color, you know, all of that. Mm-hmm. And it's changed so much over the years. And that's what I find really fascinating and, and important for having historic parks like the fort, because how are kids ever going to really understand history unless they go to these places, actually yeah. stand, you know, in the shoes of people from the past to understand the hardships that they went through. I think it's so right. important um, because, you know, movies are great and everything, but I don't know, it's being there. Himself. Yeah, yeah, being there. And I think Natchitoches as a as a city has done an incredible job, I, you know, like with, with what you do, Arlene, and then the Cane River National Heritage Area and the, all the parks and, and the city itself, just getting together to preserve the history. So when you're in the downtown and you go to like the you go to the museum downtown, go to the fort, you know, go to the Cane River Lake, I, I you guys have really preserved it 
so that the authenticity remains the integrity of the bones of Natchitoches and all the changes. I mean, the, some of your churches are like ancient, you know, they're yeah. so historic. So, I mean, the yeah, history in Natchitoches is huge. Street. I mean, even if you look at Front Street with the bricks, it kind of takes you back in time. When you mm -hmm. get to Natchitoches, it's just a totally different feel because our, you know, um, I mean, they have done a, an excellent job of preservation. And down, yeah. you know, down Cane River with the Cane River National Heritage Area. I mean, this is who we are. I mean, we are a historic city, and uh, we believe in preservation. And I think that, um, like you said, all the partners have done an excellent job to keep that storytelling going for the next future generations. Right. You know? F Felicia, um, I wanted to ask you with with this, you know, after, now that the pandemic's winding down, right? And I mean, there's still stuff lingering in the world, but um, how is it for kids now to be able to go back out and actually do these school trips, you know, and even they with their parents to come out after being locked up <laughs> for so uh -oh. long? They love it because we are a full-scale fort, meaning the what visitors walk through, what these kids walk through when they come on their school field trips, it's exactly what the Europeans would have been walking through and living in every day. And they go in and it's just, wow. Yeah. <laughs> the, the number of third graders, fifth graders who walk in and they're just amazed by how much space there is and they get to be outside but in these cool buildings and there's no light bulbs but there's candles and it, it's, we're going back to, mm -hmm. like Arlene said, not dumbfounded but just kind of stuck in awe that mm -hmm. this is here and that they get to walk through it and learn it and be out of the classroom. Mm -hmm. Be away if they were doing the distant learning, being away from the computer, getting to be out and physically looking at things. Mm -hmm. I think it brings a sense of appreciation to, to people who go to museums and they really get a, a good look back at what what people went through to be to give you what you have now mm. and yeah. you have to you have a sense of appreciation and then I think that sparks an, a real interest in history who did what before me mm -hmm. so and, I can have what I have and and when you when you're I, kids you you made forts I mean I don't I remember building right. forts yeah. when I was a kid so, so to me if you're going to build a fort you need to go to a fort to get an example so you can go home and build yeah. forts you, you know you're going to have one up of the person who didn't go to the mm -hmm. fort you know <laughs> I, yeah I wonder how you many kids have a do lot that of boxes and make a lot of peepholes tunnels boxes I mean that's the thing kids are like cats with a box the box you can do so you much with a box chairs. Always put big blankets over chairs, you know. Yep. Uh, I think it's yeah. amazing how they found the uh, the blueprints at a museum in France, you know, so long yeah. ago, and had the forethought to recreate it and rebuild it based on the original set of blueprints. It's kind of like That's it's so amazing, cool. you know. That's and I can't cool. remember how many trees or how many linear feet of wood it was used. Felicia, you might not have that number. At, I don't know. But when they built it, it was just really amazing to see, you know, the natural products that they used to actually build the fort. That's so cool. Yeah, a lot of trees. If you're looking for a rough guesstimate of a number, a lot. That's, mm. that's the best I can do. Yeah, I'm, I'm, are... I've got your website open now. And, and everyone, um, you can go to the website and, and actually... All the Louisiana State Parks, just go to lastateparks.com and, and do a search on there. But it says nearly 2,000 treated pine logs mm -hmm. form just oh, the mm -hmm. palisade, right? That's just the one part. Yeah. yeah, that's just. And so wow. everything was kind of local, tree. wasn't it, Felicia? Yes. It was. So uh, you have to go, go back to what the landscape looked like back then, where it was just forest, forest, lake. Native community, forest, forest, mm -hmm. European settlement. Like, there there used to be loads of trees. And so whenever the French came through the area, they're just clearing the spot to put their fort, and the trees mm -hmm. that they cut down become the trees that they used to build 
the palisade mm-hmm. wall, which is the protecting wall around it, and then the buildings. Mm. Wow. And, so that's a lot of it, trees. It that's a is. Lot of trees. And even <laughs> talking to folks who come in to visit on a daily, sometimes you don't realize it's not just the walls for, or the trees for the walls. It's not just the trees for the uh, building walls. It's also the shingles. It's mm-hmm. also the flooring. It's also the furniture, mm-hmm. the eating utensils. Mm-hmm. And then they need wood to burn in their fireplaces. There's right. a lot of wood that goes into building a fort. Hmm. So the other thing, too, so it gets rebuilt, but then you have the school programs, right? So that's a that's a free program for schools, but um, you also have events. And um, we'll talk about Love the Boot Week in a little bit, but um, you, you're teaching people about, and I'll see if I can get this word correct, boussiage. Yes. <laughs> good, good job, like boussiage, it. yes. Very good. Hey, I'm uh, learning. This is cool. <laughs> boussiage. So yeah, actually coming hmm. up towards the end of this month on uh, Saturday, April 29th at 10 a.m., uh, we're going to be doing a boussiage program called Let's Play in the Mud. That's cool. essentially what we will be doing for a whole hour. We're going to awesome. mix up boussiage. What that is is a mud mixture. Uh, traditionally, it would be red clay mud, animal hair, and then water to make it mixable. What we use is uh, dirt, mud. Sometimes we're lucky enough to find a clay pocket because we're just we're digging it ourselves. Mm. <laughs> but <laughs> it's a dirt. Uh, Spanish moss or hay, it's whichever one is more easily available, and then water to make it mixable. And that is 18th century insulation. They would put that in between the cracks in their wood structures, their log cabins, buildings all throughout the fort, even their ovens. Uh, We have the bread oven, and Mm -hmm. that is made entirely out of boussiage. And for this program on the 29th, we're going to start to finish. We're going to make boussiage. We're going to put it in some of the buildings here on site. We're going to make sun bricks. We're going to That's essentially cool. play in the mud for an hour. See, I and then come. at the end, whatever's left over, you can use for a facial. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> the number of exhausted mothers who say, please, can I play in that? I just need, I need to relax. And I'm like, Absolutely. <laughs> Dip your fingers in, in, it's fine. (laughs) Well, it's so is it similar, like, you know, because in the Southwest, they're doing adobe and it's, it's Mm -hmm. like just a different kind of clay though, right? I didn't, you know, and, and water and it's like a, I mean, even I know people who, who live in adobe buildings and, you know, um, there's, there's still a lot of those structures left and they actually last, you just have to do a lot of patching. So is yeah. boussiage pretty much the same, but it's just two different regions and different um, exactly. soils, it, really? They are, they are yeah. essentially the same thing. The difference with any of the mud mixtures is the clay content in your sand or dirt, mm-hmm. uh, what you mix with it to make it hold. I believe that's called an aggregate. Don't quote mm-hmm. me on that, but I believe that's what it's called to actually make the mud stick together to itself, mm-hmm. which for us would be mm-hmm. like Spanish moss or hay, and then water to make it mixable. And then you mm-hmm. you pack it in whatever technique you've learned to pack it. There really is not a wrong way to do boussiage or adobe, um, but it'll last mm-hmm. a long time. The, uh, the rock house down on Cane River, which Arlene is much more into to the goings on of the rock house down there, but that I believe is an original boussiage structure that's lasted. Wow. Yeah, they're doing cool. some restoration work because it actually had a little bit of flooding uh, from mm. 2016 when Cane River came over the banks. So they're uh, doing some major uh, restoration. Um, but yeah, totally, um, totally made of boussiage where they're going to mm. have to reconstruct and re. Mm. Uh, Actually, they're moving it a little bit so further away from the river, but it's right directly across from our office on Front Street down on the river bank. Mm-hmm. Oh wow! Hey, uh, Arlene, are the is the Cane River National Heritage Area still doing their free walking tours of the downtown? 
Yes. Uh, Wednesday awesome. through Saturday, they meet at 1030 at our office, 780 Front Street. And um, the Cane River National Heritage Area Rangers do a free walking tour of the historic district. It's about a 45 minutes to an hour walk around town, and it's very informative, and a lot of people come back after the tour, come in my office and just rave about how wonderful it was that they just learned so much in that one hour, you know? So, uh, yep, they still do that. That's awesome. And then also um, in events, I know um, the sale on the trail is coming up. May 5th and 6th, and we were talking about the El Camino Real de los Tejas National Historic Trail. This is a really good time to get on the trail, right, Arlene? This is something that right. uh, from, yep. from to Nacogdoches, yeah, This is our 15th, right? our 15th year from Nacogdoches to Nacogdoches, about a little over 100 miles between two states and, you know, five cities. You know, you go through Nacogdoches, and then you go through Sabine Parish, through Manny, then you cross over to Lita Bend Reservoir into Texas, and you go through Milam in Sabine County and then San Augustine County, and then and then in Nacogdoches. So it's a fun, mm. fun weekend on um, Friday and Saturday. People just like to do the trail and shop all the the flea markets and garage sales and rummage sales and yard sales. It's fun. Mm. And. But you've got to go to the fort, right, Felicia? People need to come to the fort during the sale on the trail. Well, <laughs> that's right the fort. in front of it. <laughs> we should be yeah. like right there on the path. Y'all, people can just stop in. Um, mm-hmm. Our usual pricing is four dollars a person from anyone four years old to sixty-one. You're four dollars if you're above or below. You're actually free. Mm. So nice. You're Young youngs can get in free, and our seniors get in free. So nice. Um, the other thing too that I know you are a part of, Felicia, um, the Ford is uh, National Kids to Parks Day, and we've done um, a couple years. We've been covering this amazing program. Um, it is nationwide, and it's put together by the National Park Trust. And um, what they do is really about parks getting your kids to parks across the country whether it's a city park a fort right or a national park you know getting kids out there and doing programs with them so um this is coming up may 20th at 2023 felicia i believe that um you guys are doing something a little bit unhistorical well it depends (laughs) on how ancient your bugs are right some of them some of them are dinosaurs (laughs) Or you would by the size of them and the way kids go, that is the biggest dragonfly. Yeah, mm. it's almost years old. Uh, wow. <laughs> uh, but we, on on uh, May 20th, we're actually going to be doing a bug hunt throughout the day. The event itself is called We're Bugging Out because we're fun <laughs> here. <laughs> mm. Cool. Uh, it's cool, going to cool. be uh, bug hunts where kids, especially ages 8 through 12, are encouraged to come out, come hunt with us. Um, we're just going to explore the park. We're going to look for bugs, see what we can find, if it's a dragonfly, if it's a beetle, anything in between. Um, and we're doing it uh, broken down throughout the day. So hunt times would be at 9.30 in the morning, 10.30 in the morning, 1.30, and then 2.30 in the afternoon. Cool. So expect about an hour if anyone with kids come out and they want to hunt with us expect about an hour of us being outside looking at nature uh trying to find bugs and if we're lucky enough to catch any we're hoping to get them under a microscope so that kids can actually see the bugs that's crazy sometimes those little bitty uh roly-poly beetles you don't really know what you're looking at until you get them under the microscope Mm. I, I'm all about microscopes. I, I love the microscope and then it turned into (laughs) prehistoric dinosaurs. Yeah. But I mean, I was one of those kids who had those little, and those little jumping star thingies. What do we call them? Like sea monkeys. Those, um, Oh, the shrimp. shrimp. Yeah. They would, you know, you'd get them like in the little package, you put water and then all of a sudden they'd move around. It's like little. And they call them sea monkeys, <laughs> but they're brine shrimp. Yeah. Right. And anyway. they would swim in circles and then you would feed them. It was way cool. Yeah. I, 
I want to be a kid again and come play with microscopes. And uh, now are you still doing events where people are dressed up in period dress? Oh, yeah. That's cool. too. Uh, On our daily, the interpretive staff tries to be in the uh, clothes of the era. Uh, The good part about, well, it's one of the good, good things about the fort is that we are a border fort, but we're also like a colonist fort. Well, so what I mean by that distinction is we had soldiers, but down here they just dressed as civilians because that was a lot more comfortable. And oh, we're hmm. able to dress as civilians but still explain soldier life without, I say, breaking character, but uh, yeah. I guess that's the best way to phrase it. Yeah, so yeah. We we dress hmm. up every day showcasing how they lived, what they did all that Mm. the other thing to bring up is love the boot week is um this week as this airs on the third tuesday the boot week started yesterday um a boot week uh arlene this is the keep louisiana beautiful campaign right this is part of our uh, lieutenant governor's um love louisiana love the boot keep louisiana beautiful campaign uh, communities all across the state this week are doing community cleanups, and um, I think that there's one scheduled. Uh, well, there's several of them scheduled around town here in Natchitoches and around, you know, the state. But I think that the um, the fort has one coming up. Felicia can probably tell you some more details on that. Um, but yep, love the boot week, April seventeenth mm. through the um, um, the the twenty second. So yeah. Mm. You know, we really want to shape like a boot. <laughs> yeah. No, I love to love the boot. I love the That's boot. So cool. You yeah, gotta love too. the boot. Well, this yeah. is I like this because shape like a boot. Then if you could take the boot and just put trash in it and and mm. uh you know, I, I think it's important yeah. to have these kind of um uh, weeks everywhere. So Felicia, yeah. uh, can mean, people join you guys and, and do something uh to help clean up the area? Yes, they can. On Thursday, uh, the 20th, April 20th, we're doing a Let's Love the Boot uh, event where at 9 a.m. folks come meet up at the uh, museum's parking lot, which we're located at 155 Jefferson Street here in Natchitoches. Mm -hmm. So meet up at the parking lot at 9 a.m. and we're actually going to walk the block around our property Mm -hmm. line. Uh, We're going to stop at the uh, Jefferson Highway Pocket Park and kind of pick up trash oh, yeah. in there, and then we're going to cool. continue around. Essentially, for especially for locals, we're going to start at the Kaiser Street Bridge, walk down Jefferson Street, stopping at that Highway Pocket Park, and then continue down to Mill Street, and then go to the back of our property line. So essentially, we're making one big block, cleaning mm. up along the roadway as we go, and then we'll go back onto the property because that leads us into Cane River Lake. And we'll nice. be able to pick up trash that's floated onto our property from that lake point. Oh, that's excellent. So that's also you're going to be going by um, that little Sibley Park area too, right? Um, or am I, in the, am I getting my you're math close. That's, the kind of, that's by the Kaiser Avenue Bridge. That's, okay, yeah, yeah because you've got that about, statue yeah. of Mr. Sibley, and he, yeah. wow, does he have some history? I was looking him up. I mean, he did everything. He was like a, a journalist. He was like, he, he was in wars. He he did, I mean, like, no wonder he's got his own lake, you know? I just want to know <laughs> if he wrote the bird books, but. I know, <laughs> did he? Wrote, I no, no, but um, he really was, uh, he, he did he went for it like in life. So that's a, I encourage people to go there and, and read about him and cause he did a lot. And um, so, yeah. And so he was a, he was a resident there and, and didn't he, didn't he do something in the war as well? Um, oh my. Oh, in the, in the re- yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. You might, he did a little bit of everything. This, oh, um, mm. Interesting man and interesting character, but yes. There's a nice little pocket park right there at the corner of by the Kaiser Avenue Bridge. And I know that uh, Felicia mentioned the Jefferson Street Pocket Park. Um, mm-hmm. And I know that you and I are very familiar with the Jefferson Highway uh, initiative that we talk about all the time. 
And on Tuesday, April the 18th, you know, we're dark today. We're going to be uh, unveiling a new sign at the first tourist park that was located uh, where the Watson Library is at the University of uh, Northwestern University campus. So we're going to be unveiling a sign there to show the Jefferson Highway first tourist camp in that oh, over I love it. years ago. Was that the, was that the library? <laughs> that, but that's amazing yeah, but, because the tourists did drive. I mean, this highway was right. started in the initiative was started in 1915. And we do a four, every fourth Thursday, we do a show just on the historic Jefferson Highway. And Nancy and I just had the opportunity. You know, we've been on parts of the highway and half the time we didn't know we were on the highway. You know, obviously, when we're in Natchitoches, we know. But um, we were driving from Wisconsin to Texas, and we did a detour. We went through Minnesota and said, it's cold. Because uh, it it was, there's ice lakes everywhere. Because this was, you know, not, not springy, you know, weather yet. Uh -huh. But um, we went through Iowa and saw where they put the signs up. And, and I, I have to say, like, driving the highway with the signs makes all the difference in the world. And oh, I can imagine sure. kids getting part of it. And people have painted the old where the old bridges were. And if you hadn't, and you didn't look at this and follow the maps for it, you know, you just would bypass those bridges and not even realize that that used to be a bridge. Exactly. You would just yeah. drive right by right. and not realize this history. But these people would camp. I mean, there's old roadside parks and people would camp, yep. car camp and you know, we car camp now. I mean, people sleep on top of the roofs of their cars with tents and all kinds of cool stuff. But back yep. then, they I mean, with, <laughs> yeah, but they were they were camping out in Natchitoches. Listen, and can you imagine Fine. doing this in the summer with all the you know the gators out there? So come on, Arlene, come on. You know they <laughs> that had to be like well, wow. I don't know about the gators so much, but definitely the mosquitoes. But a lot of people. <laughs> traveled with them <laughs> that's you know, that's your you know, state bird i heard yeah. i'm just kidding yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> but so. but you know, i i think it's awesome though and you know to to be able for people to see this is what people did back then and travel and and it's the history of of what america is known for road tripping i mean it's iconic movies yeah. have been made about it you know it's it's an iconic thing so all right so everyone love the boot week is now uh, Boussiage, go learn how to make mud in buildings uh, April 29th at the park, at the at the fort. May 20th, you can bug out and, and have fun at National Kids to Park Stay. And then also, um, the sale on the trail again is May 5th and 6th. And then Travel and Tourism Week, May 7th through 13th. Uh, Louisiana is always part of that. Uh, you, you all are you know, headliners of, of tourism, you really are. Um, you understand the value uh, as a state. Mm -hmm. I really think so. Um, of, well, we're a small well, community and, and, you know, we just love, you know, to showcase our community. I mean, mm -hmm. it is a gem when I say that it's, you know, it's just a treasure. It really, really is. And sometimes, mm -hmm. you know, how local people take things for granted, but yep. uh, I get to see and hear the visitors that come from all or over the country, international mm -hmm. visitors that come into our office. And I get to hear firsthand, straight from the horse's mouth, the compliments and just the great things that they have to say about, you know, Natchitoches. And, you know, it just makes me so proud when, when I can, you know, share my community with other people and just, you know, be proud of the history and and of the partnerships that we work with with our other, you know, tourism partners to keep the preservation and keep telling the stories. Mm, I love yeah. it. I love it. Felicia, you've got to experience that too at the Fort, uh, international visitors coming, because after all, the Fort's history is international. Uh, we get folks from literally all over the world to the point we even have a push pin map that is filled oh. up. People from Australia, uh, China, South America, Canada, all over. Uh, wow. A lot of times, uh, and that's from what I've experienced, French people will start off in Canada. Then they will drive the length of the Louisiana Purchase and either stop at us or stop in New Orleans before driving wow. all the way back up to Canada. Because, mm. like you said, it's kind of an American staple. You have to do some kind of drive. You have to go cross-country. 
mm-hmm. and they they take advantage of that opportunity to just drive straight down to us and then drive all the way back up. Mm. Mm-hmm. That you see that ties back that's to the what, Jefferson that's Highway. Where that Jefferson Highway yeah. comes in, right? Well, mm-hmm. it, it makes sense too because if you think about Louisiana's connection to Canada, you know exactly yeah. that that's I mean historically that's part of you know Louisiana's backbone. You know, and it's um, and it's so pretty. I mean, it's yeah. historic and it's pretty. So it's Listen, like a winner. It's a winner. That drive, we pretty much have done the Jefferson Highway Drive. I mean. No, we have to do but it not, again. Not, not like how we, <laughs> we want to do every stop. <laughs> we yeah. just, you know, we I mean, we want to just do the whole highway like A to A. From start yeah. to finish, yeah. And do the whole thing. But then as soon yeah. as we did it that one day. I'm texting Arlene and Roger, for the, the head of the association. <laughs> I'm like, look where excited. we are. There's a sign. We're all excited. And next thing you know, but you had, to, we, I mean, all of a sudden we realized a whole day went by and we hadn't really gone very far because we were, Whoa. it was like this treasure hunt. And then I'm like, oh my gosh, Nancy, we got to get to Texas. Like tech, like it felt like, I mean, cause we still have to drive halfway across Texas to where we are. And we're like, Oh, we are so in trouble. <laughs> we need to get back <laughs> because, because that's the thing. And and for kids to understand, like you're saying, the you know the history of the Louisiana Purchase, and to go on this kind of highway and make that it's, connection about how far Canada is. And yet it's far, but it's not that far really now with cars. But then you think about the Canadian explorers and how yeah. the people were on horseback yeah. and on foot. To make everything work, and then you get that idea of distance, and and then that's where the fork comes in too of how people, you know, here you get to, you know, seven. have a good night's sleep with seven other people in your bed when it's, you know, hot out. <laughs> I just <laughs> you've got you like, no. One of the things that always comes to my mind when we do these tours is, who would you be in history? in the Mm. spot you are now. Like Mm. when you go to a fort, who would you be in that fort? Who would you be in history? Like put yourself back. I want to be the person making ice cream, even if they weren't making ice cream then. (laughs) Actually, actually, this is a fun fact for history overall. They did have ice cream in the 18th century. Yeah. It was more common in the English colonies because they Mm. constantly had ice up there. Mm-hmm. And those who are rich enough to have an uh, an ice room, which would be like a cellar, just mm. strictly for ice. So they would oh. harvest ice in the wintry months, store it mm. in a cellar, and then they would uh, harvest it throughout the year to make ice cream. <gasps> yeah. I want to be that person. A, there was a difference <laughs> between, um, like, ice and ice milk. Like, some ice cream cones had milk, and then... Popsicles did not. Yeah. Like that was different. So there was two different factions of making treats. Like sherbet. Yeah, sherbet's a sorbet. different one. Sorbet. Well, the, the yeah, French, that's yeah. There was a French invention to make ice cream. Uh if you've ever made butter and that mm. or seen somebody oh, yeah. make butter, it's in a churn and you actually churn the milk yes. until it becomes butter. It exactly. becomes butter because of how hot the friction is from churning it. But if you put mm. that churn, that crock, into another insulated container with ice around it, the mm. milk and the cream don't separate. It becomes a cool cream. And when you mm. add sugar into it, you get something similar to Cool Whip. Yeah. And so they would churn it until it became as thick as ice cream. Oh, and that, that was a French invention that was made to go um, mm. over in, in Europe. They had a French invention for that, and the English colonies were using it to make ice cream in the New World. Yeah. See, everybody, you knew you were going <laughs> to learn about ice cream in a fort in Louisiana, <laughs> right? Who knew? Who knew? And listen, while you're in, in Natchitoches, you've got to have a meat pie. Um, that That's is right. a state food. And also, uh, there is a gas station um, food trail that you can follow, too. And we always, you know, people look at us when we talk about this, but... Honestly, you can have some of the best lunch or dinner come out of a gas oh, station yeah. in Louisiana mm-hmm. 
the whole state is like this. Listen, in Natchitoches, you're going to get meat pies. If you go to Lake Charles area, you're going to get boudin. Yeah. You know, it's everyone's got something different, but I tell you what, like po boys and oh man, mm-hmm. all right, that's it. We have to come back. And, and there's all kinds of good little fried food that we're not supposed to have. But if you're in Louisiana, you can do anything you want. you can eat anything you want you're going to be happy and there's a lot of hiking trails that you can take afterwards so it's it's all worth it but everyone thank you so much felicia yeah yeah exactly that is exactly how louisiana is eat drink be merry be happy it's a happy state everyone's happy i I love it um thank you both for joining us felicia and arlene again for natchitoches go to natchitoches.com that's n-a-t-c-h-i-t-o-c-h-e-s I'm still singing um, the Mickey Mouse, Mickey Mouse song Mouse. when I do it. Um, I anyway, <laughs> and then for uh, the fort, go to LASTATEPARKS.COM, and that way it'll connect you to the whole state park system. And uh, they're listed under Historic Parks, uh, also connected to Natchitoches.com. And also you can follow more if you go to na- NationalParkTraveling.com. We have the fort up there as well. And keep up with us at Big Blend radio.com thank you thank you all thanks ladies <laughs> thank you for joining us thank you thanks you take care bye bye